All right, I'm going to talk to you a little bit this morning about categorizing America's enemies into three rather definite groups. The three groups are these. The first group, overt revolutionaries. Second group, Fabian socialists. And third group, insiders. The first group, overt revolutionaries. These are the ones that are most easy to see. Uh, they usually shout uh, what they believe, uh, destroy the government, destroy the country. Uh, these are people who profess to be communists. As I say, they're the most easy to spot and they are the least dangerous to the three to the country least dangerous of the three groups a lot of attention is focused upon them but their chances of actually overthrowing this country are zilch group two is the one that we're going to concentrate most on today Fabian socialists, and we'll define that in a minute. Uh, Fabian socialists are not a rock and roll group. It is a philosophy. And you have heard, I'm sure, a lot about the insiders. In fact, I wrote a book about the insiders called Under Color Conspiracy, which I hope you will read or reread. I've re uh, I still reread that book every once in a while. I have to because I'm going to give a speech or something. And, uh, it's amazing how much you can learn by going back over something. And there's a lot in that book. But you know, when you talk about a conspiracy, when you talk about the insiders, there is a whole mountain of circumstantial evidence that any honest person can look at and say there's no question there is a group of insiders that manipulate the American government and to some degree the American economy from the very highest levels but there's never been an insider who has confessed there is no evidence that I know of and I've looked pretty hard that you could ever take any of these people into court and convict them it's kind of like going along a golf course and you see a lot of divots in the ground. And you know that somewhere in front of you there's a lousy golfer. But you haven't seen him yet. But there is another group of conspirators that we have definite proof. Proof that would actually stand up in court if being a revolutionary were in itself a crime. These are the Fabian Socialists. The Fabian Socialists within the United States have almost overwhelming control of education, as Alan just spoke of, of the mass media, the government bureaucracy, and certainly a large clergy. Sometimes they even sneak into tape recorders. <laughs> now most people who are Fabian socialists have never heard the term. When I got out of Stanford University, I was a Fabian socialist. I'd never heard of it. I've talked to people who major in political science in universities and ask them, how much do you know about Fabian Socialism? And they say, what's Fabian Socialism? If you go to try to find books on Fabian Socialism, there have only been two or three ever written. You go to any political science textbook in college and look for the term Fabian Socialism, and if you can find it in there, write me a letter. I have never seen one 
reference to it. And yet the Fabian socialist philosophy has been probably the most important philosophy in the United States over the last 30 to 40 years. Most Fabian socialists consider themselves to be liberals. The socialists found out a long time ago that the word Marxist or socialist has a bad connotation. So they stole, and I mean literally stole, a good word, liberal. Many of you may not be aware of the fact that people like ourselves in the last century were liberals. Liberals were people that believed in a limited government and maximum freedom for the individual. The very opposite of socialism. And a little after the turn of the century, the socialists found out they weren't getting anywhere calling themselves socialists. So they started saying, well, we're the true liberals because we're going to build a big government and we'll make that government work for the individual. In other words, it was just a, a total twisting of the real situation. When I got out of Stanford, I thought I was a liberal. I was a Marxist. I taught history at the high school level. I taught my students Marxism. I was the, just exactly what Alan Stang got through telling you about. And yet, and this is an important thing to remember, I did not know what I was doing. A teacher, when he goes to teach in high school or junior high, he can only teach what he's been taught. Before I would give a lecture to my students, I'd go dig out my notes from my history classes at Stanford. And then I'd go tell my students, I can remember some of the things I used to say about how Franklin D. Roosevelt saved the nation and things that now just made me absolutely cringe. <laughs> Total lies, but, but I didn't know they were lies when I was teaching them. If some irate parent had come in and accused me of being a Marxist, I probably would have decked him. Because uh, being a Marxist is terrible. I didn't know what a Marxist was. I thought I was a liberal. I was a Marxist. And most teachers today are Marxists and do not know it because they have no idea what Marxism is. And we'll go into a little more of that later. I'd like to go into just a little bit of the history of the Fabian Socialist Movement. Towards the end of the last century in Europe, there were a number of Marxist parties and they got into a philosophical disagreement among themselves. And the main bone of contention was whether you could bring communism to a country, whether it had to be through a revolution or whether it was possible to bring it to a country through the ballot box or through evolution. You might say that there was the, the violent people and the nonviolent people. And you had a lot of professor types who were dedicated Marxists and they, they believed in building the socialist state. But the idea of blood in the streets was sort of repulsive to them. You know, these were the sort of dandy types. And uh, they said, well, you know, we think that there's another way to bring it about. <laughs> This philosophy was particularly strong in England, where some of the intellectual types believed that it would be impossible to bring about an armed revolution within England. And they felt that the only way that they could build a communist state in England would be gradually using the ballot box 
rather than taking up guns and manning the barricades. These people formed a group in 1894 in England called the Fabian Socialist Society. One of the most prominent individuals in the Fabian Socialist Society is a, a world famous playwright, which you may have heard of, and certainly by the time you finish your education, you will have heard of, named George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw made the statement, and I'm quoting here, as a founder of the Fabian Socialist Society, I am basically a Marxist communist. Now I would say that's being pretty blunt about it. But these people said, we don't want a revolution. We want to do it slowly and we'll do it by the ballot box. You may remember uh, uh, George Bernard Shaw wrote a play called uh, Pygmalion, which was later made into a very famous uh, stage play and movie under the name My Fair Lady, which is a delightfully entertaining thing. And I remember taking my wife to see the movie, and as we were leaving, uh, I said to her, I said, well, did you spot the commie line in that? And she about crowned me. That was, we had this wonderful, uh, entertaining evening and I hear I spotted the communist conspiracy in there. I think she thought that was the the ultimate in paranoia. But actually if you have seen My Fair Lady, it's about a professor who takes a girl out of the slums and retrains her and passes her off as a princess. The whole theory being if you change uh, the environment, you change the individual. So it was a there was a communist message in there, but I don't think that should keep you from seeing the, the play or the movie. It is a delightful bit of entertainment. The, the Fabian Socialists started out in England, and they made no bones about what they were up to. As a matter of fact, on uh, the cover of this book, The Great Deceit, which goes into how the Fabian Socialists took over education. On the cover, it has a copy of the mural that appears in these Fabian Socialist headquarters in England. And uh, it has a flag back here. It says FS for Fabian Socialism. And carrying the flag is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, if that's not telling you what they're up to, a wolf in sheep's clothing, I don't know what is. Another very famous member of this Fabian Socialist Society was H.G. Wells. You may remember H.G. Wells, very famous historian, also wrote a lot of, uh, I guess maybe he was one of the first science fiction writers. He wrote a book called The War of the Worlds, which was quite famous. But he was a devoted Fabian Socialist. And he wrote a book called The Open Conspiracy, in which he talks about the fact that what they are doing is they're changing socialism from a revolution into a method of takeover by the use of bureaucracy. But the Fabian idea was, look, first thing we're gonna do is we'll get our men in as the key professors at the leading universities. Now all the most talented of the young people go to these universities and what we'll do is in the classroom we will convince them that socialism is the one and only true answer to all of men's problems. And then as these students graduate from college some of them will go into business, others will go into the clergy, some will become college professors, some will become politicians, some will go into government, and they will take their socialist beliefs with them. And their theory was, and it, and it is a uh, very true theory, 
that if you take over education with your philosophy over a period of generations, you'll take over the country. And they chose as their symbol, the turtle. Moving always slowly ever onward. And they were satisfied to, to take 50 or 100 years to make the world socialist. But they knew if they controlled education, eventually they would get control of the mass media, of government, and the clergy. Which of course is just exactly what has happened. And Wells set it out in his The Open Conspiracy. They didn't even deny it. And we talk about the fact that there's a conspiracy, even if there were no insiders, there is an admitted conspiracy to build a one world socialist super state. Wells even talks about it in The Open Conspiracy here. And he talks, here he's talking about the use of religion to build this. Since the modernization of the religious impulse leads us, leads us straight to the effort for the establishment of the world state as a duty and the close consideration of the necessary organization of the effort will bring the reader to the conclusion that a movement aiming at the establishment of a world directorate, a world directorate, in other words, the United Nations as a world government, so these people, it wasn't any uh, mystery. They were willing to put it in writing because they felt so few people would take them seriously and do anything about it. And in here he says, what we must do if we are to build this world socialist directorate, this world state, is we have to destroy the belief in religion. We have to destroy patriotism and we have to destroy the free enterprise system. I'm sure everybody here has heard of the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx, written in 1848. Very few people, unfortunately, have read it. I would imagine that most Americans believe that this is some kind of a book about uh, throwing uh, Molotov cocktails and making bombs and how to assassinate people and that type of thing. The Communist Manifesto isn't about that at all. The Communists, on page 55 of this edition of the Manifesto, sum up their entire program in what we might call the Ten Commandments of Communism. Ten ways that Karl Marx said you would build the communist state. One, abolition of property and land. Two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Three, the abolition of all right of inheritance. Four, confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. Five, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank. Six, centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. Eight, equal liability of all to labor. Nine, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country. 10. Free education for all children in public schools. In other words, if you want to brainwash somebody, you got to get them into the schools. That's one reason why you never want to have federal schools. I don't think you can find a dictator in the history of the world that hasn't wanted to control education. All right, these are the 10 points of the Communist Manifesto. Is there anything in there about throwing a bomb or assassinating leaders? No, these are all things that can be done by the ballot box. 
The Communist Manifesto is essentially a Fabian document, even though it was written 30 years earlier. All of these things, and of the 10 points that are in here, many of these have already been at least partially adopted in this country. Things like the progressive income tax, setting up a central banking system. These things have all been done through gradualism in this country and by the ballot box. So you can establish a communist country without calling it communism and without a revolution. You do it three ways through taxation, controls, and government planning. The Fabian Socialists have done that in this country. They've done it all in the name of liberalism. The Fabians have always been rather kind to the communists. As a matter of fact, Right after the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the British sent an army in there to try to put down the Bolsheviks, and the Fabian Socialists, who had control of the labor unions, threatened a general strike in England if the British did not pull their army out of Russia. And so the British did pull their armies out of Russia, and they turned over all of their arms and ammunition to the communists and the communists used it to gain final control of Russia. So if it hadn't been for the Fabian Socialists, there may never have been a successful Bolshevik revolution in Russia. Now how about the Fabians and the insiders? As I said, there would be a great threat to this country if there were no insiders and all we had were the Fabians because the Fabians' goal is to set up a communist state. But the Fabians need money. Where do they get their money? The Fabians operate in this country through a number of organizations like uh, the what started out as the Intercollegiate Socialist Society, which uh, uh, later changed its name because of the word socialist that operates through uh, the ACLU and dozens and dozens of other fronts, all financed by foundations, primarily the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Carnegie Foundation. Now here we have the insider, super rich capitalists, provide the money in this country for the Fabian Socialist Movement. They've even gone so far, the Fabian Socialists set up their own school in the 20s in England called the London School of Economics. And one of the major financiers of the London School of Economics has been the Rockefeller Foundation. Now isn't it interesting, here you have these super rich capitalists financing a movement which is ostensibly going to take their money away from them. These same insider organizations have financed the takeover of education by the Fabians, including particularly the production of textbooks. The very same thing that Alan Stang just finished telling you about. So you have a very strong interlock between the insiders and the Fabians. Well, how did the Fabians get from England over the United States? Well, there was a, even as far back as 1890, there were some Fabian groups that were started in the United States, but the big push really came right after World War I when some English Fabian Socialist economics professors 
received appointments to teach economics at Harvard University. Harvard University, then as now, was the most prestigious college in the United States. And Harvard trained many of the professors for other colleges. So if you took over Harvard, eventually you would have a tremendous influence in almost every other major university in the United States because Harvard trained the professors for these other schools. Gradually, the Fabians took over the economics department at Harvard University. They also moved in to the School of Education at Columbia. Columbia was for education what Harvard was for these other things. Columbia provided the professors at the other schools of education around the country. So if you took over the Columbia School of Education, your philosophy would eventually permeate every other school. And I'm sure you've all heard of Dewey, uh, who started at Columbia and came out with his theories on progressive education that literally swept across the country. The next major inroads made in this country by the Fabians came during the New Deal. Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected in 1932. And you remember he tremendously expanded the government bureaucracy. They set up all of these alphabet soup government agencies, the Agricultural Adjustment Agency, uh, and probably a hundred different new government agencies. These agencies then hired bureaucrats to run them. And all of the Fabians all over the country then became government bureaucrats. There must have been a shortage of college professors there for a few years. It was very easy during the New Deal for Marxists, whether they be communist revolutionaries or Fabian socialists, to get into the United States government because nobody was trying to keep them out. And when you read the history of the 1930s in this country, you think that the, the communists, that there must have been millions and millions and millions of communists in this country. Well, there were quite a few in the labor unions and whatnot by the end of the 30s, but it wasn't really so much how many communists there were, it's where they were. They went into the government, the communists, Marxists and the Fabian Marxist communists all went in under the New Deal. Then something very, very important happened as far as we're all concerned. At about that time, there was a Fabian socialist economist from England named John Maynard Keynes, K-E-Y-N-E-S one of the most important people in history, even though most people have never heard of him. Keynes's father was a Fabian socialist. Keynes all his life was promoted by the Fabians. And he came up with a new idea for running an economy. And today in the classrooms across the country, Professors teach, and I was taught in my econ classes, that John Maynard Keynes was a capitalist economist who came up with a system to save free enterprise. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is just an absolute outright lie. John Maynard Keynes was a, a Fabian socialist. He wrote a letter to a friend in which he said, my new system will be the mercy killing of free enterprise. He bragged that his system would kill free enterprise, and yet millions of college students in the United States are told that this guy came along 
to save free enterprise. John Maynard Keynes was partially responsible for the creation of the Federal Reserve System in this country. He was at the founding of the International Monetary Fund and after World War II. And his theories are taught in virtually every economics class in the United States. And he was a Fabian socialist. And we'll remember that a Fabian socialist, by definition, is basically a Marxist communist. But a man who believes that we'll bring it about through the ballot box, through gradual change, instead of revolution. A year and a half ago, Richard Nixon said, in economics, I am now a Keynesian, which is just another way of saying, in economics, I am now a socialist, or I am now a Marxist communist. What was Keynes's theory? Well, in a simplified form, it was this said, if, if business is bad, then the government in its budget should run a deficit. In other words, it should spend more money than it takes in in taxes. And he said that deficit will stimulate the economy and will get it going again. And he said, in good years, when business is good and the government is running a surplus, then it should cut government spending. So you stimulate the economy in bad times and you put the brakes on in good times. Well, that's a reasonable sounding theory, isn't it? Of course, if it worked, our economy should be so fantastic now that everybody should be a billionaire because we've run something like uh, 35 deficits in the last 39 years. <coughs> Now, even if this theory was sound as a theory, in reality, it is not sound for the very reason that politicians like to spend money and they don't like to tax because spending money tends to make voters happy and taxing tends to make voters unhappy. So Keynes's theory of you spend money in, in uh, bad times and you cut spending in good times, it's turned out to be you spend more money all the time. This causes inflation. I think we're all familiar with inflation. I can uh, just try to think of something out of my own lifetime that might have meaning to you. and. Uh, I remember going to the movies in 1943 when I was six years old and it cost me six cents to go to a movie. And then one terrible, horrible day it went up to seven cents. <laughs> What's going on? And then a few months later it went up to nine cents and we're getting incensed. Terrible, and then it went to 11 cents and 14 cents. I don't know what it is today, but isn't 75 cents to, for a child to go to a movie? It depends, but it, I don't think anybody's going for six cents anymore. And for that, you can thank the theories of John Maynard Keynes. Almost every day, you hear about how terrible inflation is, and three-fourths of the people in the United States believe that inflation is the country's number one problem. And yet, if you go out on the street and ask people, well, what is inflation? They don't know what inflation is. Almost always, if you ask somebody, if you ask 
your friends, what is inflation? They will tell you something like this. Well, you know, wages grow up, go up, and prices go up, and then wages go up again, and then prices go up again. And on and on and on you have what is called the wage price spiral. Everything is always going up. Who's at fault for this terrible wage price spiral? Well, if you talk to a Democrat, he'll tell you it's those labor unions. They always want more money without doing more work. And you can go to a Republican, or pardon me, if you go to a, a Democrat, he'll tell you it's big business that's at fault. Big business, those greedy capitalists are always raising their prices. It's the big businessmen that are causing inflation. And you go to a Democrat, he says it's the union. Are you, geez. you go to a Republican, he says it's the unions. So Democrats blame big business, Republicans blame unions. And the truth is that neither big businessmen nor unions cause inflation. Because inflation is not the wage price spiral. Now, if you people can track me for the next five minutes, you will understand more about economics than 99% of the people in the United States. Let's talk about the wage price spiral. Let's take the wage part of it. Let's say there's, uh, there's 90 of you in the room and I've got a job list for all of you people. It's all going to take one hour for each of you to do your job. And I've got a plate of cookies up here. I've got 90 cookies. There's 90 of you. And I say, all right, you all go out and you do your jobs. And you report back here in an hour. And you're going to get your wages. Your wages are one cookie. So zoom, you're all out of here. You're picking up trash cleaning up your cabin, doing all the things. You come back here, say, all right, now you get your wages. Everybody gets a cookie. All right, tomorrow we meet the same place. So, all right, guys, I've got 90 cookies here. I want you to go out, do your hours of work, and then you'll all get your cookie. And we've got some agitator here in the front row, and he stands up, he says, wait a minute. I'm not going to go pick up trash for one cookie. No way. I want two cookies or I don't pick up the trash. And all the rest of you jump to your feet and you say, right on! <coughs> two cookies or we don't pick up the trash. All right. I've only got 90 cookies, and now you people want 180 cookies to go pick up trash. Now I've got just two choices, don't I? I can either give you people two cookies, and you don't get any cookies at all. <laughs> Tough rocks, kids. You're out of work. <clears throat> Or, I gotta go to the cook in the kitchen and say, you gotta bake 90 more cookies. Because there is no way, and it agrees with me, there is no way that I can turn a plate of 90 cookies into 180 cookies. There's only one guy that could do that, and he's gone. I've either got to take some of your cookies away from some people to give you more, or I gotta bake more cookies. All right, that's exactly the way things are in the big economy. If you guys wanna go from $2 an hour to $4 an hour, if everybody wants a raise in pay, there's just so many dollars to pay 
the wages in. What happens? If I'm going to pay everybody more money, I've got to have more money to pay it, don't I? I mean, that's not a theory. That's physics. The government increases the money supply. In 1932, there was $156 for every man, woman, and child in the United States in circulation. Since that time, based on the theories of John Maynard Keynes, the government has been printing more and more and more money. Now today, there is $2,100 in circulation for every man, woman, and child in the United States. In other words, the government went out and baked a lot more cookies. But what's happened? You don't go to the movies for six cents anymore. Now it's 75 cents or a dollar. All right, the wage part of the wage price spiral. You can't have a general increase in wages for everybody unless there is more money available to pay them. It's that simple. All right, how about prices? Let's pretend we're all at an auction. And I'm going to auction off this watch. Too bad. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need, I needed a watch, you had it. That's Marxism. All right, we're gonna auction off this watch. And you all take out your wallet, and you count up, and see how much money you have that you can bid on the watch and these other things that I'm gonna sell you. I'm gonna sell you a UN t-shirt. I'm gonna sell you that uh, deer on the back wall. You can imagine how hard that deer was running when he hit that wall come through like that. All right, so we're auctioning things off and you've got so much money in your wallet that you can spend. Then right in the middle of the auction, through the back door, bursts your friendly government bureaucrat. And he's got a great big bushel basket full of Monopoly money. And he's, here's a handful for you, and a handful for you, and here, everybody gets a handful of this new Monopoly money. Terrific. You say, geez, I only had uh, $10 before to bid on things, and now I've got 20. Terrific, I'm twice as well off, aren't I? Right? Wrong. Because everybody else has got more money. So what happens? We start the bidding on the watch, and people not only use the money they had in their wallets, they use all that new money that that government bureaucrat handed to you. So now the watch, instead of selling for $2, sells for $4. Why? Because the money supply was increased. If you go home and look up the uh, definition of inflation in your dictionary, it doesn't say anything about the wage price spiral. It says a rapid increase in the supply of money. The money is then used to bid up wages and prices because our economy is an auction. The economy of the United States is a gigantic auction in which millions of bids are made for different goods every day. The cause of what the establishment calls inflation, when you watch uh, uh, David Brinkley on television every night, he says, well, we had 3% inflation last month. He is misusing that word. He's talking about prices went up 3%. The cause of inflation is literally the inflating or the increasing of the money supply. Increasing the money supply without increasing the amount of goods causes the price of goods to go up. 
Now, if you understand this concept of the, the cookies and the auction and understand that the wage price spiral or what the liberals call inflation is the effect it is not the cause the cause is increasing the money supply and this goes back to the theories of John Maynard Keynes who said increasing the money supply will stimulate the economy it hasn't stimulated the economy. As I said before, geez, we'd all be rich if it stimulated the economy. All right, where does money come from? Well, you know, it is very fashionable today to blame cattle raisers, to blame farmers, a gas station attendants, all of these people for inflation. They don't print money. A guy that raises cattle doesn't print money. A guy that raises onions doesn't print money. Automobile manufacturers don't print money. The only people that print money is the government and their controlled banking system, the Federal Reserve System. The politicians blame everybody but themselves for what is called inflation. When the Democrats blame the big business and when Republicans blame unions, they are either stupid or they are demagogues. The only people that are at fault for increasing the money supply is the government. They are the only people that can counterfeit money legally. Now to go just a little bit into the background of money. Money started out back thousands of years ago. I guess nobody really knows how many thousands of years. And there was a barter system. You know, maybe you own some cows and you would trade butter to somebody in town who made shoes. And it was just a strict, strictly a trade. Well, this works to a limited degree, but what if the shoemaker wants butter, but you who own the cows don't want butter, you want furniture. It starts getting complicated, doesn't it? So what they said, well, geez, we need some kind of a medium of exchange so that the guy that to make shoes can pay for the butter with some kind of money that is exchangeable for the guy that wants the uh, farmer that wants to buy furniture or something else. So that's how money came to be used. But money hasn't always been these pieces of paper. Money started out, been lots of things used throughout history for money. They settled on gold and silver primarily as money. Why gold and silver? Well, it was scarce and it wouldn't rot and it was universally wanted by people. Now, let's say uh, I've got a cow for sale and uh, this gentleman here offers me a bushel basket full of leaves for my cow. And this gentleman offers me five ounces of gold. Now I got to think about it. Gee, shall I take the gold or shall I take the leaves? Now, if you'd taken economics at Stanford like I did, they'd say, take the leaves. Because <laughs> that gold is bad stuff. But farmers were smarter than econ professors. They wanted the gold. And so gold came to be universally accepted as money. But once the politicians got involved, they didn't like gold being used as money. Why? Well, you can't make gold out of nothing. 
You can print lots of these, but you can't create gold out of nothing. Now, John Maynard Keynes and his theory said, we've got to get gold divorced from money. It used to be up until 1934 in this country, money was backed by gold. Gold coins actually circulated. You can still buy them at coin collector shops. And the government had billions of dollars of gold and, and behind every one of these dollar bills was 1 35th of an ounce of gold. And they could only print so many of these because they couldn't print these unless there was gold behind them. Well, boy, the politicians thought that's just terrible. We can't have inflation if we have to back our money with gold. So Franklin D. Roosevelt called in all the gold. He said, well, we're in an emergency and we'll give it back to you in 90 days. But in the meantime, we've got to hold it for you. So be patriotic and turn it in. And lots of naive patriotic people walked down with their gold and gave it to the government. And then Franklin D. Roosevelt said, well, we can't give it back to you until the emergency is over. Now that 1934 emergency is still on. They still haven't given it back. Now they print lots of these. Now the wage price spiral really started going out of control about six years ago when Lyndon Johnson totally removed all gold backing even in theory from the dollar. Now how much money can they print? Well, how much paper can they get their hands on? I mean, they can literally make every one of us a millionaire. Probably everybody in this room will be a millionaire in 10 years. You think, wow, man, am I going to live it up? Well, that's true, but probably when you go down to McDonald's for a hamburger, it'll cost you 100,000 bucks. And this is not as absurd as it sounds. You know, I can imagine if I told people back uh, 25 years ago when we were paying six cents to go to the movies, that someday people would be paying 75 cents to go to the movies, they'd have thought I was nuts. There have been many, many examples in history where we have had runaway inflation. It got so bad in Germany after World War I that wives would bring bushel baskets to their husband's factory at noon and get the bushel basket filled up with their husband's morning wages and then would run down to the grocery store to spend the money before it became worth less. New money was printed every day. It got so bad that they didn't even print both sides of the paper because it wasn't worth the ink. And you can find examples of 10 billion mark stamps, equivalent of a nickel stamp, 10 billion marks. Once this thing starts going, it goes and goes and goes and goes. The government creates money in two main ways. One, through the Federal Reserve System, it lets banks increase the money supply. And the other way is by running up the national debt. I don't want to get overly complicated here, but in essence, what happens, suppose that you could go down to Sears and Roebuck and Company and buy everything there that you saw that you wanted and then run home, go down in your basement, turn on a printing press and turn out the money to pay for it. Why, well, my gosh, you could get everything you wanted, right? This is essentially what the United States money system is. The government spends the money, goes in debt, and then creates the money to pay for that debt. If 
The government goes $10 billion in debt this year. It will create $10 billion new dollars to pay for that debt. Now, as we have a money system whereby the more money the government spends, the more money there is for it to spend. I think my wife would love that system for herself. The more money she spent, the more money she'd have to spend. Terrific. But remember, all of that new money goes out and bids up the wages and prices for everybody else. When Richard Nixon became president of the United States, the national debt was approximately $250 billion. Today it is $375 billion. In other words, a third of our national debt has come just of all the debt we have had since 1793, has about a third of it we have accumulated in the last five years. Richard Nixon has run up $125 billion in debts. That means that by the time it goes through this progress of the new money being created, there's 125 billion new $1 bills out there, or their equivalent in credit, in, put into the auction. That's why the cost of living is up a third since Richard Nixon has been in office. Now, Richard Nixon used to say, if you run debts, you cause inflation. And then he started running them. He said, well, we'll stop this. We'll have wage and price controls, which he originally said he would never do. And he had a very good analogy. He said to put wage and price controls on an economy when you are increasing the money supply is like bolting down a lid on a boiling cauldron and then stoking the fire with more logs underneath. And that's just exactly what it is. Now, one or two things is going to happen. If you have a cauldron full of boiling water and you clamp a lid on it and then you throw more logs on the fire, one or two things is going to happen. Either you've got to take the lid off after a while and let the water boil over or the cauldron's going to explode. So what did Richard Nixon do? Well, we had phase one where he put the lid on and phase two where he took the lid off and it all boiled over and now hamburger that was 65 cents a pound is 85 cents a pound. Inflation has been compared to, it's been called the economics of addiction. It's like a dope addict. A guy that shoots heroin has to have a bigger jolt all the time to get the same kick. It's the same thing with inflation. In order for the government to keep things rolling and not to have a depression, they have to keep inflating the money supply faster and faster and faster. And they're caught in a dilemma. If they stop the inflating, we have a recession or a depression. You know the difference between a recession and a depression? A recession is if the, your neighbor is out of work. A depression is if you're out of work. The government just doesn't call them depressions anymore. They call them recessions. It doesn't sound as bad. But inflation, once you start inflating, you keep on inflating more and more and more. And things get worse and worse and worse. And then you have people screaming for controls. This is what inflation causes causes controls, rationing, and higher taxes. You watch now, there's a lot of talk now about, well, we gotta have higher taxes to take some of this money out of circulation, which of course is a total fraud. What they're saying is, we'll take the money away from you and let the government spend it. 
It's all right if the government spends it, but it's bad if you spend it type of thing. Well, we know uh, from history and even from the last six months or a year that uh, controls don't work. To, co to stop inflation, the government has to stop the printing presses. They've got to stop the money machine. They've got to balance the budget. If we do that, we will have a recession. Because everybody now is hooked on the more and more money being put in circulation. Now a politician looks at it this way. Unemployment is worse than inflation. And I don't care what happens as long as the cauldron explodes after I'm out of office. Pass it on to the next guy. Try to keep the thing going on some sort of a basis until I'm out of office. That's why these Fabian socialists that came in under Franklin D. Roosevelt with the Keynesian system knew that once they got the country started on it, it would be almost impossible to get us off. Even if you change administrations and the Democrats go out and the Republicans come in, you don't start with a clean slate. The new guy inherits all of the problems that the old guy had. So Richard Nixon, instead of deciding to take his medicine, it's kind of like the, uh, uh, the Democrats uh, got to go out on the binge and Richard Nixon would have to take the hangover. And Nixon said, I don't want to take the hangover. I'm going to go off on another binge. Let the next guy have the hangover. And this goes on and on and on until eventually the thing destroys itself. So as far as what you people can do to understand what is going on, you can make tremendous progress in recruiting. I don't think that the John Birch Society has ever had as great an opportunity for recruiting as it has right now because the wages and prices going up what people think is inflation is hitting almost everybody these shortages which are directly related to inflation are hurting everybody now people are willing to listen now almost everybody knows something's wrong and we can explain to them what is wrong. I have a very close friend who majored in economics at Stanford. He's a millionaire, he's a, he's a major contractor. He builds 500 unit apartment buildings. And he told me the other day, he said, I did not understand money until I joined the John Birch Society. Now people want to understand money. So we have a tremendous opportunity. It is the Fabian socialists, the people who admit that they are a conspiracy to set up a socialist world who gave us the Keynesian economics that have caused the runaway inflation that we're having now and the shortages, the scarcities that we're having. There are two books that I would heartily recommend that you read. The most important book, I think, and when I was just beginning in the conservative movement, I read this book four times. It's called Keynes at Harvard. It's put out by a group of Harvard alumni. It is not the easiest book to read, but there is nothing in here that is beyond your comprehension. It is just a fairly small type, and there's a whole lot of names in here and whatnot, but I think this is just about the most important book there is to read. Another book, a great handbook for the Fabians, is Fabian Freeway by Rose Martin, which goes into the history of the Fabians 
particularly in the United States, the organizations which they control, the people that have been uh, very important in the Fabian movement. I haven't thrown a lot of names at you this morning because I don't think that that's all that important. It's their philosophy that is important and how successful they've been. I'll throw it open to questions now, if, uh, if everybody's sufficiently confused. Yes. Well, again, we get into this thing. The idea of the multiplier was, in uh, Keynes theory, that, uh, for instance, if you, if you deficit spent $1, by the time it got going through an economy in, in which there was um, unemployment, that that one dollar would create uh, four dollars worth of um, new jobs, new assets, and whatnot. And I think we can just tell by looking at the economy, we've had all this fantastic deficit spending uh, since Keynes's theories first came in. We've had something like uh, $350 billion of deficit spending, and if that all created uh, four times that amount of new jobs and new assets, there would be absolutely no unemployment, and we'd all be rich. I mean, obviously, it's a theory that is false. If you want to get into the, the technical aspects of that, uh, there is a very good book that dissects Keynes from an economist sta standpoint uh, by Henry Hazlitt, H-A-Z-L-I-T-T, -T, uh, in which he goes into that multiplier theory at quite a great extent. But that sounded great to people that I said, gee, you mean if we spend one dollar, we create four dollars worth of new goods and stuff? Let's try it. And they, they've tried it 350 billion dollars worth and we're worse off than we were. Now it costs you 75 cents to go to a movie instead of six cents. Terrific. If they were right, you should be able to go to the movies for a penny. Yes. Okay. I will try. Gold acts as a break upon the politicians. If they have to have a 35th of an ounce of gold for every dollar they put in circulation, then they are limited as to the number of dollars they can put in circulation by the amount of gold that they have. In other words, if you had um, a billion ounces of gold, uh, you could only print 30 times that 35 times that amount of money. But what they have done is said, well, gold has nothing to do with money. And when you say that gold or silver has nothing to do with money, that means they can print as much money as they can find paper. And they seem to be able to find a lot of paper. Politicians hate gold and silver because that keeps the politicians honest. It restricts the amount of money they can spend, and they don't want to be restricted because they stay in office by going out and buying votes indirectly with government money. They'll go on and say, uh, uh, we're going to build a new dam in, in uh, this area, and we're going to build this in this area, and we're going to build that in this area. There's all going to be spent money spent by the government. Where does the government get money? The government can get money only one of three places. It has to tax for the money, it has to borrow the money, or print the money. Now, when they borrow the money, when they borrow it through the Federal Reserve System, it is the same as printing the money. So from a practical standpoint, it gets down to there's two ways that the government gets the money it spends, and it's, it's spending uh, um, I don't know, several billion dollars a day now. Uh, three, what's the, 268 billion dollars I think is the budget this year. It has to get that 268 billion dollars 
in reality from one or two places it has to tax for it or it prints it now if i go to you and i say look i'm going to build a dam in your district and therefore i'm raising your taxes then you say to yourself gee i'm not too sure i want my taxes to go up i don't want the dam that bad but if i go to you and say look i'll build a dam in your district and your taxes aren't going up you say well gee that's keen i'm getting something for nothing but in reality, you're paying for that. In the long run, when you go down to the grocery store and all this increased money that the government has printed drives the prices of everything up. Clear now? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, you get into a sort of a conflict. The question is, why do we have a recession if we stop the printing presses? You get into a kind of a complicated economic uh, thing there called malinvestment. During, and I'll try to see if I can simplify that, during an inflationary period, a lot of businessmen go out and, and let's say uh, I own a factory and inflation is going on, business looks good. So I go to the bank and I borrow money to expand my factory. but. The re let's say I make widgets. You know, that's the, every Econ 1 class, you make widgets. I, I think, well, I'm gonna expand my factory and I'm gonna borrow the money and make, make more widgets. Then when the government stops printing the money, then that new demand for the widgets doesn't exist. So I have overexpanded. Businesses during a, an inflationary period tend to overexpand, and then when the inflation stops, they're caught, and they they can't sell that extra stuff they geared up for, and so then there's unemployment. So it's a that's why it's a vicious circle. It's like a, a heroin addict should never take that first shot. You should never take that first shot of inflation. Because once you start on this thing, when you stop it, you're going to have a reaction to it. Now, obviously, you're, the, the sooner you stop, the better off you are, because it's going to be worse if you do more of it. You know, if you got a, a $10 a day habit, you got to kick that habit. That's not as bad as trying to kick a $100 a day habit or a $200 a day habit. So the longer you go, the worse it is. But people, the tendency of people and politicians is to say, well, uh, we'll just have some more of the good stuff and we'll forget the, the bad stuff. And this is why the, the Keynesian theory was, you print more money in uh, bad times and you uh, stop it in good times. But in the practice, they just print more. They print more money in bad times and more money in good times, both. And it goes on and on and on until eventually we're going to get to the point where, uh, uh, you know, a hamburger at McDonald's is going to cost you $100,000. Maybe you ought to buy a McDonald's franchise. Yes.